Uh, PCs had first come out. I, that dates myself so bad that you guys, probably most of you realize, don't realize that there wasn't a time without them, but uh, there was, you know, everything was changing and programming was big and so uh, the business school actually had a computer science major at UCA. It's now called QMIS, I think, or something like that. Anyway, uh, I took some classes with that because you, you were guaranteed a good income right out of school um, and Axiom was hiring people by the droves. Um, at that time they were CCX and um, so I took some classes, did well in it because it made sense to me, but I thought, I cannot sit in a cube. I mean, I am not that person. So I took a marketing class and like, the clouds parted and the sun shone for the first time and I knew I was supposed to be a marketing major, so I finished out. Luckily, all those classes went toward, toward my business block, so I didn't have to, I didn't lose any hours as I hopped around majors. It, uh, I think I had to have 120 four hours to graduate and I graduated with 124. So what did you do? Since, you know, overdo it. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do when you graduated? Well, uh, as I said about CCX, Axiom, they were hiring up a lot of a marketing majors too and it was kind of a given I thought that I was going to go to work there and had talked to them and as happens in the corporate world, they had a hiring freeze on. So I was kind of sitting around hanging out, trying to um, buy my time till that was over, and I got a phone call from uh, a, a cousin, and I have a cousin for everything, legal or illegal, so just let me know if you need anything, and I've got a cousin for it. So this cousin wasn't in prison, and she had a job at uh, the old First National Bank, what's now Regions, and she was like, okay, we have a marketing assistant position open, and they don't know who to hire, and why don't you come take that? And so 32 years later, I am still in banking, so, you know, you go, okay, where you have one moment that could have really changed your life, I mean, if I had gone to CCS, who knows, I probably would be unemployed, but I'm sorry, that was tacky, that was real tacky. No, because, you know, nobody works there that long. It's like, you know, or they go back. It's the, that industry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me just step on that a little bit more. So, um, so talk about that was your first job. How did you know what to do in banking? And, uh, and also, even just the interpersonal, like, email. Like, well, we didn't have email. email. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Just, like, how did, how did I know how to do it? Well, um, I actually, my, this first job was working for a guy named Bunny Adcock, <laughs> who knew that my very first job was going to be working for a city leader and that somebody that would be a mentor for me pretty much uh, my whole life. And I was a sponge because I was this kid from Melbourne who had never been in a business environment. My college job was basically in police, you know, so I had no experience in business whatsoever, and so uh, I just tried to show up and do what he told me, and if he asked me to do 10 things, I tried to do 12, and um, if he asked me to stay 15 minutes late, I tried to stay 30, and just, I, and, and my theory was I, I was making very little money, but I wanted to, it didn't matter, it's a job, so you should work as hard as anybody in the company. So I thought I worked as hard as uh, the bank president, and I put that effort out, and I guess it showed, and I got to continue up, but I, I mean, I still do things the way Bunny did. I, I look back and go, okay, even how to write business correspondence, uh, how to call customers, uh, that was very influential to me, uh, was how to prospect business and then, uh, and not be afraid to just cold call someone. Did you feel comfortable asking questions to money? Oh, I sure did, because I was too stupid to know anything any different. I mean, I just did, and he loved, if you know money, he likes to talk, and he was, he, he, I think he liked that about me, is, and that he had an opportunity 
um, to do that. Now, there was another gentleman that worked with us, and he was very different. He did not, uh, he wanted to give me orders, and that was it. But Bunny, Bunny was, he wanted to help bring me to, to be a business person, you know. He would joke every now and then about the Beverly Hillbillies and if I was going home to see my family, and, you know. But he, it was all in good fun, because uh, he's from McGee, and that's not any better. But, you know, the world is made up of people from small towns, so, you know. Okay, so you're 20-something at this point. What did you do next? Well, I realized uh, in the banking world that I needed to move around within the bank if I was going to get promoted. Uh, if I was going to be a real banker, I, need to, I needed to learn real banking. Now, they never, in my career, they ever let me touch money. I, I, don't, I don't do that. They're afraid of that. There's a reason. Uh, but so I've never actually been a teller. I, I was for about 15 minutes one morning, and I was trying to count money going one, two, and then I realized they go, one, two, three, four, five. So I was like, okay, here, they just took it away. and went, no, we will never let her touch money. But uh, so I moved around and did some lending, got in the lending side because in the banking world, more money is on the lending side um, and upward management, there's a lot more positions as well. So I did that for a little while and then the marketing, um, actual marketing officer left. So I went running back over there going, oh please, let me come back to marketing. And so I did that again for quite some time. What after that? Okay, so um, our bank, the old First National Bank, was owned by First Commercial Bank, a uh, corporation of, uh, that was out of Little Rock, and they had their corporate marketing position come open, and so I took that position and commuted into Little Rock for a couple of years. That was a real learning experience because I got to see how a big bank did things, and so I was a liaison to all of our small banks, so we had banks in uh, three states and I would travel to those and I might do marketing that at one bank that would be um, a full marketing campaign like we had a bank that was hit by a tornado and all their signage was tore down so we just changed used that uh, time to change their logo and update their brand and, uh, and then others would have marketing officers and I would just need to give them a little advice I did all of some Back then, it was called MCIS, uh, you know, customer software. Uh, I, I actually ran that on an old DOS system, but I would do research for each bank. Um, and so I learned a lot. And then one, one day, uh, that bank got bought out. And marketing folks are the first to go in a bank merger. And so I was 30, 31, 32. Uh, at 32, I guess, and uh, no, a little bit older, 33, single mom, uh, and suddenly unemployed. Now, I say suddenly, it wasn't sudden. They were good. Uh, that bank was awesome, To They gave us two months advance notice. Uh, I had been there 13 years, so I got uh, six months pay. So I didn't, I never freaked out. I should have, looking back, I should have freaked out. Uh, but I wasn't. And again, Axiom, they're like, oh, you can do database management. We want you to uh, come and, and work for us. Oh, but we have a hiring freeze. That's been a story of my life. But, and, there, and it's all for a reason. You know, God has a plan. Um, and so I sat around waiting for their hiring freeze to lift. And uh, I got a call from a man named Bunny Adcock that said, hey, we're starting a bank from scratch and we would like for you to work for us. And I said, well, when do you want me to start? And he said, well, you can wait a couple weeks. I said, I'll be there Monday. I had been sitting home, you know, for uh, about six weeks and I, it was a good cleansing time. Um, but I had, when I realized I was scheduling my going to the grocery store around Oprah, that, okay, it's time to go to work. <laughs> So I, I got the opportunity to be the first employee of what is now Centennial Bank. So what an opportunity, especially for a marketer, uh, to build a brand from scratch. You know, everything from logo to attitude and um, products and concepts and everything. Now, the, that was the good thing. The bad thing was I was also the HR director, the retail manager, the compliance officer. Uh, and a lot of things 
that I really didn't know a lot about. So um, it was it was a learning time for all of us. And I I got to I I called myself the first lady uh, of the bank, and I got to be that because I was unemployed at the time. They all had other jobs, so they couldn't start quite as quick. Uh, so basically, a, a crew of us that had been with First National Bank of Conway came over and started that bank from scratch. Um, and that was a huge challenging opportunity. Uh, one of the coolest, probably the coolest thing I've ever gotten to do in my career. Uh, still love those folks. Um, you know, don't work there now, but um, some of my best friends are there. So I have a couple of follow-up questions about that, but I also have just a random question. Do you love to work? I mean, are you? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I would have never been that same old person. I was the one. You know, after I had my son, I come back to work and I walked in the bank and I'm like, I'm back. And no one had looked up and I'm like, they had to have missed me. <laughs> I am here, people. Um, and I, I didn't have that, oh, I just left my son. I, I didn't. But now my mom was keeping him and so that helped me. But no, I love to work. And my years uh, starting a bank and, you know, I had a, a I was still a single mom, and he had to learn to, he did homework sometime in my floor. He worked every grand opening event I had. Um, he worked tokes up booths for me, um, you know, anything that I was doing. And I think he's now 28, and uh, I think it's helped him be self-employed. One, he had the confidence to do that, and the ability to talk to anyone, because he had been doing it he had been, you know, handing out um, samples of some, you know, brand opening or something. He, he was always, so I know someone bought their son and I told him, you too can be a, a yeah, successful business person someday. Awesome. Uh, a little bit more on the work ethic front. Can you talk, do you feel like you were always like that? I mean, you were always driven? Oh yeah, it was. It, it's a thing. I mean, I, I guess. I was the one that sold more cookie dough, except we didn't have cookie dough back then, because back then you actually made cookies from scratch. But if, it, if we were selling, you know, we were selling cups or, um, you know, what membership, you know, uh, magazine subscriptions or whatever it's called, I always won. Uh, I remember one time, this is a new thing for y'all. Okay, we used to, your cups come in a glass bottle and you recycle them. And so it was, we had to gather up as many Coke bottles and for recycling, because you earned like a nickel or something to return them. And I won that award as well. So I, I was driven. Now granted, I only had about 19 to compete with. So, but I, I was, I was, you know, the one that put to, together the school yearbook and, uh, you know, I was that person. So, uh, and now I look back and go, maybe I was bossy. I don't know. <laughs> I'm the school yearbook too, so. Okay. Um, but, but somebody's got to do this right. So, follow the question to that, Jeremy and I are in leadership markets all together, and uh, we hear a lot of talk about how millennials don't have work ethic and, do you find it hard to hire people with a work ethic like you had when you were growing up? It's different. I, I find that they, they are still <laughs> out there. They just kind of do it in a different way, but that different doesn't mean wrong by any means. Uh, but no, there are still folks with a lot of drive. <clears throat> I don't know exactly what the age group breakdown on millennials is, but um, Tara Mallet worked for me and she is a mini me. She has, I, I, you know, I saw myself in her at that age, you're, you I am a millennial. Okay, I mean, yeah. so, and so you know, she's. Uh, I I know it's there. Now my son is millennial, and he is a different person. He's a fly fishing guy, and so he's got this kind of hippy drippy, laid back lifestyle. But he, you know, he is very busy, and it is very. It's not what you think that. Oh, he goes fishing, but. Um, I mean, he has to be on the ball, and, and he fished over 250 days last year, so that is a lot of fishing, and that's in bad weather, and, and so I think he has a work ethic that it's just a little, it's done in a different way. Okay, I didn't mean to get off on that tangent. So, back to Centennial. Okay, so, so I was with Centennial, 
additional 13 years. Um, I was, for those of you that know what Stuck on a Truck is, I was the Stuck on a Truck creator, um, along with my coworkers, but uh, I actually dreamed the word stuck on a truck one night, so I came up out of the bed and went, stuck on a truck! I know that sounds bizarre, but I dream, uh, back when I did ad campaigns, I, dream, I dreamed the, a lot of them, and I dreamed some really bizarre ad campaigns that were so not real and unique, but you've got to sift through to, to get to the good stuff. But, um, so I got, they let me, I had a wonderful opportunity in that Johnny Allison, the owner of the bank, um, knew that to be successful, something had to be sold. So you have to sell something. So uh, he always said most bankers don't know how to sell. And um, he trusted me and gave me a very large budget to, um, Actually, I didn't even have a budget. I just did whatever I wanted to. And so that is a marketer's dream. And, but when you're starting from scratch, you, I mean, you kind of have to do everything. And so um, here we went. And we did, I wanted to do crazy off the wall stuff to brand ourselves as the different bank. Um, and when you're starting from scratch, you know, and Conway was a, is a young town, so to, I didn't ever want to be that stodgy bank. I, I swore I would never take a picture of a banker sitting behind a desk with a library looking thing behind them or a bookcase. Um, uh, you know, if I took a picture of a banker, he, I mean, I put our CFO in a bathrobe and put him on the front page, you know, you know in a big ad, and so people paid attention. He's never forgiven me for that either, but he did it. Um, and so, just to be different, and I didn't look to banking for inspiration. I looked to, for retail and uh, automobile sales and things like that to get ideas because we wanted to be the different bank. And, uh, you know, as we went along, that was great. We were the fastest growing bank in the history of the state at the time. Um, and it was a wild ride uh, and very, very fun. And, you know, I got to do things like stuff on a truck, and that sounds like fun, and it was really, it was the funnest thing I've ever done for a few years, and then it was like watching paint dry, and then I realized how bad my feet hurt, and how I really needed to sleep, and how the, they were having the same hallucinations year after year, and, and I, you know, it's like, okay, if I see that person with the, uh, you know, talking and crying at the same time, and, and all that, I, I don't think I can do that anymore. So, anyway, time goes on. We became a publicly traded company uh, in 2006, seven, uh, seven, six, six, and that changed the ball game because we were we were a different bank at that time. You have a different set of rules to follow. You have to meet stockholder expectations. So fun for Lori was over because no longer this endless budget. I finally had to, you know, put things um, in line and do that. We started then. We rolled all of our banks up. We had bought banks along the way. We rolled them all up into one, changed the name to Centennial. Um, and while, again, um, it, it was, I still loved it. It was, it was very, very different. Even our shareholders meetings, where we had had, there we created the concept of if we let you buy stock in our bank because we were privately held and we could control it, um, you had to become a partner of the bank. And so we called them partners, we didn't call them shareholders, and they let me have these twice a year, these big windings that I threw for the shareholders, and we would just do crazy stuff. And so they loved it, it was, it was a big sales rally. Well, once you become publicly traded, your meetings with shareholders, I mean, have to be very business oriented. Uh, the, you know, it's like the thrill is gone, is what I felt like. And um, it, it changed the way we did everything. And uh, I gradually, over time, lost my creativity a little bit and, and was ready to do something different. Okay, so what path you from there to where you are right now? Okay, so. Uh, I, I I was really really burned out on marketing. Didn't think I could come up with a creative thought um, because at that time we were acquiring fail banks in Florida, and I was hopping on a plane and running to Florida, and that sounds all fun until you're stuck in. And there's some parts of Florida that are not very glamorous, 
and what you see on TV is very different than some things that are there. You're working, even if you're in one of the glamorous places, you're in Key West, and you're locked up in an office, and you're under uh, extreme conditions. You're buying a film bank, people are crying, going, oh, I'm not going to have a job, and then, you know, my job was always to try to pat them on the back, and I couldn't promise them yes, they would, because we probably, maybe not, and so it just, I, it lost some of its appeal. So uh, one day I, uh, just the right thing happened, and I decided I needed a new, a new, a new something. So I had been approached years before from Harvest Bank uh, to, if I ever wanted to come to work, just call. And I said, okay, uh, I'm ready to do something different. And, so they hired me as a business development officer. So I got to basically the networking that I had done all through my career, I finally got to take advantage of that and actually be on the sales side of marketing. And it was almost like the pressure valve was released. You know, it was like, okay, I can be fun again. I can do things on my own terms a little bit. And, uh, so basically, I did that for several years. The interesting thing about that, and you never know why you do something, really. Sometimes you just do it because, and that I did a little bit because, but I've been single all these years, 17 years, and uh, my son had finally gone out of the house, and I was on the beach with some friends and ended up being by myself one day, and I said, okay, God, if you're ready for me to have a man, I guess I'm ready, but obviously I do not know how to get one. So you are going to have to just drop him in front of me. So I had been at RS two months, and a customer walked in, asked me on a date, and we married nine months later. So that was my thing. That was my reason for going there. And, and people go, oh, are you not sad that you left Centennial? It was like giving my child up for adoption, kind of. But I had the ultimate reward in uh, you know, happiness for years, and I had no idea. Never, that thought never crossed my mind. And now I thought, they should have put me in the bank lobby a long time ago. I had been sitting in the back office where nobody could see me. So all it took was six weeks in the lobby, and I had a man. <laughs> and they wouldn't let me touch the money either, but they let me sit in the, that I got to sit right there by the front door and smile and he walked in and he said you smile so pretty at me every time I come in of course I had no idea who he was and, and he had money in his hand and I went they don't let me touch the money and he said that's not what I'm here for and I'm like wow okay our first day I went I put a bathing suit on and we went to the lake I went we're going to just let him see what it is I'm going to waste my time if he don't like it we can just move on down the road Give me a whole picture of water. I'll get back. Watch that. Um, 
So that was one thing I did. Um, I, and during that time period, I got named Businesswoman of the Year, the Diamond Achievement, which was kind of a thank you name. It's women in business, uh, kind of lifetime achievement, which I was, I'm like, am I old enough to get a lifetime achievement? <clears throat> and I guess I was. So anyway, I did. And uh, then I got a phone call one day from Jim Hawks, who is a local businessman, I've known forever, but he says, I want to talk to you about something. And I thought, oh, he, you know, he wants to do business with me. <coughs> Excuse me. But, uh, so I go over and he said, how would you like to be a bank president? I said, bank president? I'm a girl. Do you not realize I'm a girl? Girls don't get to do that. And he said, I, I kind of know you're a girl. And I'm like, okay, well, at least I've got that part uh, accomplished. But he, I said, I'm also from the marketing side. Uh, you know, most bank presidents are lenders that have come up through the lending channel or they come up through the operations channel. Uh, marketing folks rarely get the opportunity to, to have that role. And he said, now we understand that, uh, but we do want you to make loans. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, something, that, again, something different. And so we'll see. I said, now you know I don't do that accounting stuff. I tried that many years ago. And I, I'm, if you're hiring me to be a bank counter, that is not going to happen. And, and so I met with the owner of the bank, and he t explained to me there are trackers and skinners, and I am a tracker, and he will hire all the skinners I need. So that I told him he could put that on my business card. That would be fine. I am an official tracker, so my job is to get business in, in the door. Um, so I'm the only female bank president in town. No one else. Go girls. <laughs> Specifically, what is that like for you to be trailblazing in that way? Oh, I don't really pay that much attention to it because most of the bankers in town are my buddies. You know, at uh, when I started in banking, Conway was a town of 30,000 people, 27 maybe. We had two banks. This was uh, Western Auto. There was bicycles hanging from the ceiling here. Um, it was a very different town than what it is. French banking laws changed, and then so other banks got to pop up. So it actually gave a lot of opportunity for a lot of people. But uh, one thing about it, yes, it is definitely a male-dominated industry in the upper management. Not, um, and, and really not even a lot of women in the living role in the past. <coughs> I'm so sorry. But, um, you know, everything changes. And there was a time I got told once, well, I would have given you that impression if you hadn't been a lady. Um, and it was the interesting thing, it was business development because, you know, he said I couldn't take a man out for lunch. <coughs> so whoever wants to go to lunch, you guys, I'm buying. <laughs> Because I can do that now. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, it, I never thought of it as a handicap because I never thought of myself any different than the guys. I was, um, I was one of the, I always tried to be one of the cool kids in high school, and it was the same thing working for the bank. I was one of the cool, and it was me and a bunch of guys. Um, I remember being pregnant and sitting at the law committee table and my son was moving around and my stomach was doing this and they all had to stop and watch because, you know, I was the only girl in there and <clears throat> they were like, wow, what is that? <laughs> I'm like, well, you ought to feel it from the inside. <clears throat> so, I was always kind of the only girl, the only woman. Uh, and, and it wasn't because, a lot of the time the women didn't want to. There's a lot of women that don't want to be a bank president, and that's totally fine. Um, and, but the ones who do usually can make it. So question not, not really from the female standpoint, but more of just, I think anyone who trailblazes in their career probably faces some of those people. So you talk about how, um, how you dealt with anything like that and, and how you 
How, how did you deal with it? Yeah. Um, one thing is you just can't sweat the small stuff. You just have to let that stuff roll off your back. I am a glass half full person, and that's I think that's really important in career building is because you can really get wrapped around an issue or uh, just make a change. If you have to make a change, make a change. And whether it's you're burned out or you don't like your boss or, or whatever, it's okay. You know, it's okay to do something different. Um, but you also have to understand that every job has a little hair on it and every company is not, there's always something and you've got to decide can you, can you live with it or not. Um, and, and it's different at different points in your career. Like, like now, I mean, I'm, I know I'm on the downward side and I'm looking to retirement and I have a goal set. And I can tolerate some things now that I wouldn't have tolerated 20 years ago. So that's kind of a, I actually had a conversation with a gal I was uh, trying to mentor yesterday. And she's trying to decide that, you know, she's 29 and her next step and not a, and I'm like, okay, if I was 29 and I was unhappy, I would go somewhere. I would make a change. It's okay to make a change. It's a little different, you know, at my point. Um, you know, my goal is to sock away money in my 401k, still be successful and do, you know, do what I want to do. But I'm on my terms now a little bit more. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit more in control of that. Well, what, what is your advice for people? I mean, when... If you are unhappy, at what point is it like, okay, I need to pursue something else? Trust your gut uh, when you finally feel there will be something that will take it from over the top. <clears throat> it was for me. Um, I had somebody say the right thing to me, and I went, okay. I, I knew <clears throat> there was going to be something. I'd already planned in my head, okay, the next time I feel like this, I'm going to do something about it. And that thing happened, and I did, and, and uh, I have no regrets. Um, and, you know, I, I still, um, I still wish Centennial Mike very much success. I kept the stock. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> that's part of my retirement plan. And I, the bank I work at is where apples and their oranges, there's two different things. It's a, a different concept. I'm more of a community banker, so I fit the mold better where I am now than the big corporate person. Um, you know, I, I spoke to some kids at Mount Vernon at my old high school two days ago, no, yesterday, and I said, it's important for you, first of all, you can do anything you want, no matter where you're from, but it's important to own who you are. Uh, I am a girl from Mount Vernon. And that's a wonderful thing, I think. You know, I was telling these kids, it's good. You, it's small. You know everyone. You feel loved. There's a lot of advantages to it. And, and go with it. Um, that's why the first thing I told you is I'm from Mount Vernon because that's who I am. Now, first of all, I could say I'm from New York City and you would know I was lying. You would know that. Okay? So be real. Be the person you are. And uh, don't hide that. Uh, use it to your advantage. And you know, occasionally you get the right person. I might talk just a little bit more southern than I do some other times. It just happens. But you know, it, it is part of me. So follow up to that. Can you talk about the importance of confidence and how sometimes your confidence ups and flows? Absolutely. I, you know, I, there was a time in my job where. I mean, I think I've, I've always been a confident person, um, and I, that goes back to your family and how you're treated, and, I guess, and I, I guess I think all my family were very confident people, but uh, I, I did lose it in my career, um, you know, uh, and that was about the time I changed jobs, and it took a while to get it back, uh, it took a, a little while, I had, I thought, I thought I was going to resign from Centennial Bank and I was going to slither away and no one would know it and I would get over here and hide under a rock for a while. Well, when I resigned from the bank, they put it on the front page of a log cabin and I ended up having to leave uh, town for a few days because my phone was ringing and everybody wanted a scandal or something and, and they couldn't grasp that 
I just didn't want to be there anymore, but since I was the first employee. <clears throat> and then I realized, okay, that actually helped build my confidence that it was a big deal that I left. But then, I, you know, it, it did. It just took a while. And I had, uh, I just uh, didn't feel as, uh, well, I had lost my creativity. I had a boss that didn't appreciate my work. And um, I, it was it was just a moment, and it took a while. Um, maybe getting a man helped. I don't know. I got over it pretty quick. But anyway, a few months um, went by. It took a while, and I would say almost about the time I got offered the job as a bank president, I never thought anyone could look at me in that way. Um, while I was known as a really good marketer. Nobody had ever said that I was a good banker um, and that I thought of them as two different things. And I finally realized it's not um, that, again, nothing, uh, no money is made unless something is sold and I have the ability to sell. And so I need to, I need to be uh, glad that I have that skill. And I do have that skill and um, I've been successful I would say in, in my role now. So, so talk about leadership for a second, especially having had lots of different experiences as an employee. Um, and, and I'll say too that your reputation way precedes you, and I have heard so many good things about you, just oh, from being wow. and your mentorship and things like that. So, yeah. can you talk about your leadership values and how you lead people? Well, um, one thing, uh, and, and how I got there is. I enjoy networking, and so I commend each one of you for coming tonight, and the most important part of being here was probably the hour before you got here to meet people. I started doing that, luckily uh, in banking, that was something that they encouraged you to do. And not if you're, well, if you're in management, they want you to be involved. And so I started getting involved, and I would join boards and committees and what and that was one thing Lenny did and he taught me that early and um, I went back to my old okay I'm running the yearbook and I'm like okay if I'm gonna be on a committee I might as well run it you, you know so there I went and so I did I've done a lot of things you know I was chairman of the United Way and blah 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 and this and that and uh, the chamber and I've done a lot so I've learned actually some leadership skills along the way from a lot of good people I mean I was on uh, a committee with Charlie Navholz one time, and uh, you know some really big people. And then Linda Lynn asked me to to join her as co-chair uh, to fund, raise money for the new senior center. And I jumped at the case, not that I wanted to raise money for the senior center, but I wanted to watch what Linda could do. And we raised two and a half million dollars in uh, ten months. And uh, while I I created the buzz around the campaign, she was the one that had the contacts that she could call up and get 50,000 and 300,000 and that, that kind of money. And I was like, wow, that's something to see. And that was, that was you know, years of her career. So I, I've got to see a lot of that. Um, as far as leading my staff currently, I would never, um, would never ask them to do anything that I wouldn't be willing to do. Um, I want to keep a fun, light atmosphere. Um, nobody wants to come to work and have Debbie Downer sitting there and the wall, you know, make it fun. Uh, when I make a big sale, I do a lap around the lobby. And um, that's true. That's true. I, I would encourage Tara to, to call and have a good deal with that deserves a lap. Let's go, girl. And so now it freaks out some of the staff, especially the new ones, because they don't know what I'm doing. But um, so I. You know, work, it shouldn't be um, boring. It shouldn't be, um, I just always want to keep a lot of atmosphere. Um, and the customers appreciate that as well. So um, I do my best to, to do that. But the, I think the most important thing is hire people to let them do their job and get out of the way. Um, if you trust them enough to hire them, the last thing I will ever be accused of is being a micromanager. I've been micromanaged and I hate it, and I would never do that to someone. What about the mentorship component? I mean, do you, like the person you were just talking about, I mean, is that someone who you who sought you out or you sought out, or how does that work for you? Um, I have sought out, 
I have sought out folks, uh, and some, it's, it's gone both ways. Linda's the one that came to me that time um, because she thought we would make a good tandem team because yin and yang, and she, you know. Um, but uh, it, it's really gone both ways. I, um, I think by me jumping on a lot of committees and boards young in my career, I got the ability to do that. And so I have now, I can like next week, I'm going to lunch with the mayor on Wednesday, and I've got blah, blah, blah. You know, I, the mayor and I were in Leadership Institute together in 1991. Um, so I don't call him mayor, he's barked to me, and I can call him and ask anything. And that's one of those deals when you start that young in your career, and it, because you never know who's going to be the next mayor. And you know, you don't know, okay, so you don't know if he's what he's going to be in the future, so you better be nice to him, first of all, because he could be your boss, or you know, or he could be your father in law, or something like that. I mean, you just don't know what's going to happen, and so uh, never, don't burn your bridges and uh, meet as many people as you can and try to remember them, and that. That becomes the problem now that I, I can't uh, remember names as good anymore. I'm like, I know I, I know I know you from somewhere. Where is it? So okay, I have one more question before we open it up. Can you talk about establishing a credibility and respect as a young leader? <clears throat> Again, it goes back to the hard work. Uh, if they ask you to do ten things, do twelve. If they ask you to stay late, stay extra late. Um, and I really believe that it, that works in any arena, whether it's your volunteering, you know, step in and volunteer, um, go ask, okay, I'd like to take on a project, or, you know, give me the opportunity um, to prove myself. Uh, don't be shy, you know, you're sitting in, a, in the corporate world for sure. Um, they're not going to notice you unless you put yourself out there. So you're in charge of you, and so uh, that's your destiny. And most of the time, if you don't ask, you're not going to get a promotion or something because they don't know that's something you want. And that was really bad uh, early in my career because a lot of females back then just never dreamed they could be in a management role, I think, or didn't want to. And so, you know, I was over there going, okay, I'll take that on. Yes, no, I'll do that. Um, and, you know, it just kind of uh, snowballed over time. All right. Does that make sense? Yes, and I have, I have a lot more questions, but I know I want to give you guys a chance. So, any questions? Oh, I'm here all night. Let's roll. <laughs> so, when you're in a startup with Wire, and then you, you discuss wearing millions of different hats, uh -huh. when you're in that situation, how do you organize what work you have to do? Um, I, the, I did it back then the old fashioned way where I had a Franklin day timer and I wrote down every morning my tasks for the day and prioritized them. And, um, and sometimes that means things get pushed to the next day and that sort of thing. And, and you don't always do, do it well. Um, uh, I like to think of it as, uh, in the old days, that. There used to be a TV show called The Ed Sullivan Show, and they would have guys that would do tricks and stuff, and <clears throat> they, were, they had these sticks and they had plates on top of them, and they would make the plates spin. And it is, your goal is to keep them all there. One can wobble, it's okay as long as it doesn't fall. So that's the deal. Sometimes it's okay to let something wobble, and you get you get what I'm saying with that, you know, it's like, and that is, that is, that has been like my professional life. Don't let the plates hit the ground. Thanks. So what's, um, if you, you know, you've been involved in a lot of boards, um, of the last how many years you've been in business. So why do you think being involved in community leadership, whether it's nonprofit or whatever, why is that so important to you personally? Or, and I'm not talking about professionally, but on a personal level, what does that do for the community? What does that do for you? Um, what does that look like? Well, I, I, again, I go all the way back to my parents. My parents were very, they were givers. My mother um, always was doing everything in the church and the PTA and that sort of stuff. My dad would uh, 
he worked for a company that he got to hire people, and so he would ha- he would hire all everybody, pretty much every male in my little hometown worked for my dad at some point, and I got to see them giving back. It was really important, and I just have always felt that that was what everyone should do. Why would you not? Um, because you can put a little bit of effort. If a bunch of people do that, and you can really accomplish a lot. Yes, it's helped me professionally. Yes, it's helped with my confidence as well. Um, and I one, it's just the right thing to do. Um, now, I have done some nonprofit work or charity work or uh, projects outside the office, and some I've done because I had to, and some I've done because. <laughs> I'm passionate about it. At this point in my career, I try to do something I'm passionate about. When I met Daniel and we started Deliver Hope, the last thing on earth I wanted to do was start a nonprofit from scratch, but I felt led to do that, and I felt like um, he could take my skills uh, and combine them with his passion, and we could do something special, and we have. Uh, But I can ask now that I've done so much over time uh, and it's been, and I'm not sitting there saying that to brag. It's only because I've been around a long time. It's just like you know, it's acu- it's it's accumulated, and and it looks like that's all I've done because of my resume on the boards I've been on is just too. It's it's almost embarrassing to look at. I'm like, okay, I guess that's all I've done. But uh, anyway, um, now I'm to the point where I say no a lot, and I only say yes if I'm passionate. So when you're a young mom, how do you know what to say yes and what to say yes? That was hard, um, and I had to say no more than, you know, that goes back to the prioritizing. I, I say no more than, than normal um, at, at that point, um, you know, but I did, he was the most important thing, and so um, if it wasn't something I could bring him along doing, then I, I pretty much had to say no. And then in different times of his life was different as well. You know, once he got up and got a vehicle, you know, then my life was ruined because he was no longer needy of me. But he's still needy. He's still needy to me. <laughs> Don't tell him I said that. You love the win or hate the lose? Both. <laughs> Both. I do. Um, probably more love to win. I mean, I can I can accept a defeat. Tara quit on Tuesday. I've had to quit. I've had to accept that defeat, um, and it hurt. But it wasn't a loss that bothered me. It was. Uh, I mean, actually, I didn't feel like I lost. I felt like I lost because she was gone. Um, but you do have to accept it. And go on. It's a big world, and, and so I think I really do like to win more. Does it I hope that makes sense? Mm-hmm. I'm trying to paint a picture of the laps around the bank with the walks of dogs. Uh, <laughs> job. Job. With a uh, little yelling and hands in the air. Yeah. 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 And then the, you know, and I, I try to do it with the customers who are not there because that's very frightening. <laughs> <laughs> and, so you've made a lot of deals over the years. There's been some reports approved for their loans and some that were not. Can you talk about some of the differences of those, maybe the characteristics of the people who are asking for the loans, the types of businesses? What do you find to be successful in this world? Those that um, take the time to plan and, and really weigh out the odds. Those with a good business plan, when they come in, you can read it, the difference, just like that. Um, you know, just because they've always wanted to open up a, a clothing store, you know, I just want to do this all my life and now I can, doesn't mean you're going to be successful at it. You, you, you see that they put the time and the effort to do the research behind it and they have uh, the statistics to prove it. So that's, uh, it, and I, it really, I really, there are not all, very many that teeter, you know, close. Most of them, it's, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, now, the banking world has changed a lot with um, regulation, and we're highly regulated, and 
So, you know, sometimes there are numbers that you have to plug in and they have to fit. Um, but a big part of that is, is your projections on what you think you can do. And um, if you if they put a good plan together and it makes sense, then let's roll. Other questions? No one? All right, that's perfect because we're right on time. Um, we were way behind, so. Okay, well, we end always the same way. What's the one piece of business advice you would leave us with? Um, one, okay. Um, be nice. Um, being a rear end will bite you faster than anything, and it'll come back around. Um, and I, I think that's in your life. Um, it just really, I know that it's really, you think that has nothing to do with business, but if you be kind and considerate to your coworkers, to your customers, um, it'll come back. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Lori. We, the gift, or the Thomas for Life gift card, do we have a winner for that? Yes. It is ready in use. Woo! All right. Okay, cool. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, I have some business cards out here. If anybody wants to ask me questions later, I'm very honored to be here. I can't believe that I actually, that people actually got out to, okay. to come in here. So, yeah, you go Mount Brennan. Yes, and I seriously, I had a lot of questions, but we just, I have, you have so much knowledge. Yeah, so you are such a mentor to so many people, and it really is an honor to have you here tonight, and thank you for, for everything you do for Conway. I mean, seriously, I had like a million questions about your civic engagement and all of that and everything you need to give back, so thank you for everything. Well, if you want to give me those questions, I can put them in an email, and you can send it out to me. All right. You want to put it on the website. Awesome. Because I am so knowledgeable. You are <laughs> typically the third Thursday of the month. So check back at our website, airconductor.org, um, for our calendar events, and we will see you next time. Thanks, guys.